Well, today we are going to talk about the front seven, and you can't pick a better guy to do that than Justin Tuck, a guy who has a Super Bowl ring, has Pro Bowl appearances with the Giants, one of the all-time Giants greats, and he is a teammate of Jeff Eagles. He joins us on the program now. Justin, hope all is well, and thank you so much for your time today. What's up, Tuck? Um, what's going on, guys? How y'all doing? Good. Real, real well. Uh, I'm going to let Jeff start this one off because, after all, it's not often we get one of his Super Bowl teammates on the program. <laughs> No, it's not. They're all really tough. But well, I'll tell they don't you want to thing. talk to you. That's the problem, Jeff. No, they well, run. That, that may be it, but I will tell you that, you know, my good friend Justin Tuck will always talk to me. I know that. He immediately texted me right back um, and said, absolutely, I'd love to come on with you and Paul today. And we have you here today, Justin. Thank you so much for joining us for a brief period. I hope you and your family are doing well. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the upcoming season, um, a little bit about last season, and just kind of get your take on what the direction of the defense, particularly the the front seven, and you know the re-signing of Leonard Williams and uh, um, Ojolari or Aziz Ojolari. That's a tongue twister for me. I know, yeah, I know it's not I'm, for the I'm, other I'm guys. Glad. Glad you said that, man. Okay. Well, I've been working on that. Yeah. I'm going to butcher it eventually again, but I'm going to leave it to you to talk a little bit about what you talk, uh, what I just asked you. And again, it's great to have you on here, Justin. Oh, my pleasure. And you know, obviously, you know, with COVID last year, I didn't get, a, get the opportunity to be around the team as much as I would like to have been, and normally would have been. So you, there is some new faces and, and some guys that I haven't, you know, don't really have, you know, the. the I, I wouldn't have my normal insights on how these guys practice and how they look on the field, but like I, I do think one of the strong suits of our of our unit was the defensive line, uh, and, and particularly the defensive you know, the front seven from last year. You know, those guys played tough. You know, obviously you talked about the the re-signing of Leonard. Uh, we're obviously going to lose uh, Thomason there, but you know, I, I think that 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 has to be the unit that always has to be you know our our, our calling card. The, 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 the part of the, the defense that we can lay our hat on. Um, if you think about the success that this franchise has had throughout the years, obviously in the '80s it was the linebacker crew. I, you know, I pulled Carl Banks and and LT into the D line because they were rush ends for the most most for the most part. But they, you know, obviously played the linebacker crew. So with him, with those two, and 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 and, and you know. Um, why am I blanking on his name right now? He's a Hall of Famer. Right now. I don't be, uh, Michael like, Strahan. That'd be good. No, 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 no. In the 80s. Um, oh, you're talking about Leonard Marshall? No. Leonard's Marshall. not a Hall of Famer. Harry? Harry Carson. Harry. God, I yeah. didn't think it was Harry. Oh, I see. I what thought you were talking D-line right? there for a second. I, um, no, no, no. I, I, was, I was thinking like, the, you know, in the 80s, in the 80s, it was the linebacker crew, right? It was it was those it was those three. Mm-hmm. They, they were kind of like the, the forefront. And obviously, when, when Michael came on, me and O.C., when, when we went around – and won two more Super Bowls, the D-line was kind of like that. So, you know, over time, the Giants have always been known for their front seven. That's what I was trying to get to. And now, you know, that seems to be, you know, that calling card again with Leonard. You got, you got, you know, you know, uh, a lot of pieces of the puzzle that I would like to see, you know, go out this year and really make a name for themselves on that defensive line. You, the only one that everyone is, you know, kind of looking at is Leonard. So from that perspective, though, it's a lot of young talent. It's a lot of new guys on that on that on that on that front. You know, obviously we drafted the guy out of Georgia. I won't even try to attempt to, to say his it's name. It's easy, Justin. Uh, it's easy. It's yeah, easy. Sure it is. But like I, I do, I do love what you know what they're doing. Obviously, I was I was four three. I'm in a four three defensive end. They they went to the three four. But that that defensive you know front and the secondary for that matter held up pretty well last year, considering um, you know we you know. What, what we were able to accomplish last year. I, I think for me personally, I'm excited about, you know, what they will continue to do and, and what they'll do with another year under that belt, belt in this system. Well, Justin, let's start with that defensive line because the guy who was missing is Dalvin Tomlinson, who has signed as a yep. free agent. You know, he's gotten away elsewhere. Yep. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of folks, and justifiably so, who wanted to see both he and Leonard Williams return. But with the cap yep. issues the Giants had and with the amount of money that they spent on some other positions, they're going to go with Austin Johnson and Danny Shelton, two NFL veterans, to kind of fill that hole. How much do you think they will miss Tomlinson? They clearly have Lawrence and Williams back, but the, the guy playing the nose is going to be a different name this year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to kind of, you know, 
took my crystal ball here because you knew what you you had in Thomason. You knew he was a you know basically what a three four year starter there and just one of those lunch pail guys that everyone loves to be around and and and, and don't necessarily fill up the stat sheet, but he, so many of the things that he does he did for that team allowed other players to play freely, allowed other players to make plays, and obviously he made plays himself too. So like you obviously know that like. That that is going to be a big hole to be filled, but I I think anytime that happens, you do want to bring in veteran guys. You just you do want to bring in people who have, you know, know the know the ropes, know how to go in and and fill the bucket. So I think that's where we are with him and, and at that no position. Uh, it puts pressure on Leonard because he has to be the focal point on that on that on that defensive front and 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 help help those guys you know pull the rope the same way. Right? He he's the He's the person that everyone's going to be looking to in that locker room when it comes to D line play, and he has to find a way to be the, the leader to to pull the rope and get all the guys to play at that certain level, right? But I, I do think, you know, the, you know, I was one of those people who would love to have seen uh, Devin back, but you also understand that it is a business and there's a, a certain amount of money that that goes around, right? So, um, you know, obviously we wish him a lot of luck, and you know, I, I was a part of a team where we lost a guy named Barry Cofield, we lost a guy named. You know, um, Lindell Joseph, Joseph too. Yeah, so those are those are similar names when I think of the, the quality of player that 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 Devin is, and we got to find a way to have other people step up and fill that fill that void. And that's going to be a you know that's not anything new. That's going to happen next year, the year after that as well. It's going to mm-hmm. cons- consistently do that when you got good players uh, in in these positions that you might not necessarily be able to afford the next year when that contract is up. Justin, you know, um, you play with a lot of great players, and I, I think that when the Giants re-signed Leonard Williams and the, uh, after, after having the year that he did last year, um, obviously there's going to be some attention paid, played to him every game. Um, how, yeah. much of, how much of that is real um, from your perspective? And because, you know, you had Michael there, and did it, did it kind of – everybody paid attention to him. Did it free up you guys? And when Michael left, you were there. So how much of that is, is – we talk about it all the time, but I'd love to hear your perspective on it. And is it a real thing? Is it going to make a huge difference? And how will they work around that? And will it open up some, some different uh, – possibilities for the new guys like Ellerson yeah. Smith, the new draft pick, and then um, Aziz Ojolari. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of a guy named, you know, Lorenzo Carter. Like, mm-hmm. this should be a year where he, you know, there's no longer he's the young guy. He's in year four, he was a promising guy out of Georgia as well. He, they're bringing in another person that's from Georgia to basically take take his position, right? So he he has a lot of pressure on him, on the, on him this year to come out and show why they, 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 they've kept him around for four years. He has a, a opportunity now where we're going to have a, you know, more, more, more uh, talent in the secondary. So you would think that we would get the quarterback to you know, hold the ball a little bit longer. This year, you know, I'm, I'm putting my money on him to have a, 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 a pretty good year this year for us. But I, I, to answer your question, you know, when, when Michael was there, I got there a little bit later in Michael's career. I, you know, obviously I've had plenty of conversations with Michael of what it looked like from you know, his prime years, those mm-hmm. years from year four to year, you know, 13, obviously, somewhere around in that range, right, where he was literally the most dominant player in, 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 in the NFL. Uh, and knowing what it, you know, knowing what his body took and, and all the things that he had to do as far as the double teams and, and moving him around and trying to get matchups with him to be successful. You know, I, when, when me and O.C. started to kind of make our run together, you know, it was such a beautiful thing because O-line couldn't, O'Lyman couldn't double team. You know, you had to pick your poison, right? Mm-hmm. And I think what O'Lyman, you know, you know, offensive coordinators did was like they was like, listen, if we got a Pro Bowl we're going against OC, we're going to try to leave him one on one. Well, we love that matchup. If we got a Pro Bowl we're going on Justin, we will try to leave him one on one. We still love that matchup. So wherever the weaker part of the O line was was pretty much how we thought of us three. Who was going to get the more double teams that year, that game, right? So it was, a, it was a kind of a fluctuation, but I do think it's real. I think when you got a guy like Larry who can make plays not only with you know the quarterback hits and the sacks, but in the backfield as far as the run stopping ability, you know, it, when you got a person like that, especially in a three four defense where I know he he's a lot more comfortable in that that, that three scheme, he's going to cause rabbit havoc. And if I'm offensive coordinator, I'm definitely sending I'm paying more attention to him, even if it's not a double team. You might slide the line to him. Uh-huh. So for us, setting our blitzes gives us a, a, a better understanding or at least, you know, um, 
a guessing guessing effort as far as where we can bring blitzes from because the line's probably going to be sliding more towards Leonard. So it's a lot of things that, you know, when you have a stud like that on your D-line and you can kind of, you know, play the chess game as far as where you're going to kind of show different looks and so on and so forth. Uh, and that always, I think, benefits the people that will be around him. Two-time Super Bowl champion defensive lineman Justin Tuck joining us on Big Blue Kickoff Live as we discuss the Giants' defensive front seven this year. Justin, I often call the pass rush a deal where you have a Batman and a Robin pass rusher. The one guy who was super dominant and then that that partner, so to speak. And, of course, you with the Giants, there was you, there was Michael, there was O.C., there was J.P.P. There was always a twosome or a duo. The Giants right now don't really have a second guy who could threaten double-digit sacks to complement Leonard Williams, who did have double-digit sacks last year. They had to scheme up their pass rush last season. Sure. How difficult sure. is it to do that two years in a row? How much pressure does it put on Williams to again be the Batman if a Robin does not emerge from this other collection of outside edge rushers that they have put on the field? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? I think I think Patrick Graham did an amazing job of Taking the talent that he had on that defense and getting, you know, I, what I would say, you know, um, the lion's share of the talent to, to produce on, on that on that football field. You know, he's coming in. Like I said earlier, they'll have a, a, a extra year under his system, right? It, it should be just free flowing for all the people who were there last year. Because I know, I, I you know, obviously not there as much as I would have been, but I, I can look at a, a, at the film and see that Patrick was doing a lot of different things. It's, it's a lot of things that goes on that might slow your players down because of the complexity of it. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying that was the case, but I'm just saying, like, they should be even more comfortable in that scheme this year, play faster, play more confident. And he'll, it'll allow him to do more of those things to kind of free up some people or get some other people who might not necessarily be the pass rusher that Leonard is or that me, O.C., and the straight hand were, but getting them some to match some favorable matchups where they can win some, some, some opportunities there. That's what I, I think will happen this year, uh, especially when you think about the additions that we made in the secondary. Uh, you know, all this all this stuff goes hand in hand, right? If, if you're if you're a dominant pass rusher and you're always playing from behind, your offense is not getting you any points. Well, yeah, how many opportunities are you going to have to actually showcase you being a pass rusher? If I'm down by 14 points, that offense is not throwing the ball as much. They're going to run the ball and try to eat up clock, right? So you're not getting opportunities. So it all it all works hand in hand. I, I love the additions that we have on our offense. I I think that we'll put up more points. I think we'll be in situations where you're getting in the fourth quarter in that two minute situation, where you know those those pass rushers can put their ears back a little bit more than they were able to do last year. And 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 then, again, that just creates more opportunities. So I guess the long way of answering your question is I. I don't think in this system you necessarily have to have that Batman and Robin. Obviously, it helps. But you can have, you know, four Robins, right? And it gives you an opportunity to get those one-on-ones. And, and that's one thing that Patrick Graham, it seemed that he was really good at doing, dialing up things where guys was in the one-on-one situations. And at that point, you gotta you got to win. Um, and if you don't win, then, you know, we need to do something else on our, on our – we need to call our GMs and get us some better talent in there. Jeff, I'm going to ask a follow-up here with Justin, specifically about Leonard Williams, who had a breakout season last year. I don't know how much you were able to study his tape from what he had done when he first got to the Giants in the midseason trade from the Jets, but if you were able to find the biggest difference as to why he had that bust-out year, what do you think it would be? You know, I... uh... I just know he's a little—he's more comfortable at the three, and I—I I don't know if that 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 season he came over from the Jets if he was playing more nose or I don't you know. So I'm not I'm not saying that as a reason, but I know most of his plays last year were in the three technique, which he is has become a a a dominant player in that situation. Um, I you know without studying the film and being able to study as, as, as much as you guys are, that's the one thing that I know with a difference. And I talked with Leonard a little bit, but I, I you know it, it's funny how you get into a situation. You come over from a team, you come over from you know a different coaching staff, you can come over from a different scheme, 
And once he gets the whole of it, it's just like that scheme was built for you. I think this scheme with Patrick, you know, Coach Graham is, is, has put in here and the things that he got to play in, it's built for a player like Leonard, right? So on addition of, you know, him playing, you know, mostly the three-tech position, but also some of the things that is built into this defense that gives him a little bit more flexibility. Um, it just seems like he was so much more comfortable in, in this in this scheme. And that's what, I mean, I know I've been, I've been in defenses that, you know, I, I, I just knew it wasn't built for me. And and it's hard to kind of, you know, thrive in those. And I've been in some where I knew it was, this is right on my alley. You just, you just get that confidence to play better. So I, I think those two things might be uh, issues that you've seen with the, the, the kind of resurgence of, of Leonard's play. Well, speaking of the resurgence, I mean, 11 and a half sacks from the defensive tackle position is getting it done, uh, Tuck. Sure. So, you know, I, I think that – this team does have a, a Batman, and that would be Leonard Williams. How difficult will it be for him to? And I know that this sometimes there, there are circumstances that you know guys get sacks here and there just because they're jumping on the pile like you did. No, just kidding. Sure. Um, sure. The fact exactly. is, how how <laughs> difficult <laughs> how difficult will it be for him? And I don't want you to look through your crystal ball. Just maybe give me an idea of, of how difficult it is to come back from a year where you, uh, by the way, as a contract year, got eleven and a half sacks. It's pretty darn good. Yeah. 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 No, that's, and one of the reasons why I said you might have a you know four Robins is I don't I don't think you're a Batman until you've done it multiple years, right? And sure. obviously, you know, everyone knows about Leonard, you know, being a high draft pick. He came out on the scene in the Jets and played really well, and then kind of hit the wall. And then, you know, this year, like you said, a contract year, he came out, he did his thing, and and all the 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 publicity that he's getting, all the notoriety he's getting is well earned. Uh, but you know, for for me, I I just live by the creed of you know I, I never forget it. Michael told me it was like, all right, you did it. You when we won that Super Bowl and he retired. He told me uh, you did it to get your name out there. Now let's see if you can keep it there. And yeah. that's that'll be the same thing I tell that'll be the same thing I tell Leonard. Yeah, you're you're there. People are talking about you when 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 offensive schemes are being put together. You know, when they have to play the Giants, those offensive coordinators, the first name they're going to put on their board as far as people that can't wreck their game is going to be Leonard Williams. Now, let's see what you do with that. Mm-hmm. Because some people thrive in that and knowing that they are the guy. And some guys be like, ah, oh, man, I was I was better when, when the, no one knew who I was and no one was scheming for me. And, like, I'll never get it. Michael retired. O.C. got hurt my second year. I mean, they, at, you know, my fourth year of the year after the Super Bowl, the first Super Bowl. And I was kind of the only, you know, only guy, right, that people knew. Now, Matthias was making his run, and, he, and luckily for me, he stepped up and played a, uh, you know, an unbelievable season for us there. But those first couple of games when it was when it was Michael retired and, and O.C. got hurt, I was getting the crap kicked out of me. And I called Michael one day, and I was like, man, how did you do this for so many years? He just started <laughs> laughing. So that'll be the same situation here with Leonard. Now everyone, he's going to be, it's going to be a bull down his back where offensive the coordinator is going to say, this guy cannot wreck our game. Like, you know, and that's what I said about Lorenzo Carter or whoever else is going to play in that position. Those players, those people in those positions are going to have opportunities to, to have the one-on-ones, opportunities to have the, the favorable matchups. They have to win. And if they win, then the offensive coordinator, the next games are going to be like, well, you know, Leonard is the guy, but we can't double him. We can't just single him out. We have to play it a little bit more even cup, and that's when you'll see Leonard start to dominate again. I think um, so. That's 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 hopefully how the season goes from a from a pass rating standpoint. Sure. In my in my eyes, um, Justin, I know you don't have a whole lot more time, so I'm going to ask my final one before I hand it back off to Jeff. Let's talk about the rush defense, though, because we all know you got to get teams into those bad passing situations sure. by sure. stopping the run first. And yep. the Giants' rush defense last year was very impressive. And that guy in the middle, Blake Martinez, uh, at inside linebacker, yeah. my goodness, I'd like to get your impressions <laughs> of him because he has done a yeoman's job. Yeah. Listen, I, I, had the, I had the ability to play with some really good linebackers. One that comes to mind instantly is um, uh, Antonio yes. Pierce. You know, so AP was the type of dude, he, he, didn't, he wasn't going to blow you away with his 40 time. He wasn't going to blow you away with, uh, you know, any measurables from lifting weights or any of that stuff. What he what made him so successful, he was smarter than anybody else on the football field. He was the quarterback of the defense. I mean, him and, and Peyton Manning would go toe-to-toe. Him and you know, Donovan McNabb would go toe-to-toe as far as that chest 
move to get the defense in the right system or the right you know stunt or whatever it was right before that ball snap. He was he was better than anybody else I'd ever heard about or seen. And when I think about Blake, you know he's probably a little bit more athletic than AP is. But what I what I see from him is his instincts. He, you know he doesn't have a lot of false movement in his steps. He gets he gets downhill. He gets to the place that he's supposed to be, and he's rarely fooled. He's rarely late. And and from that perspective, when you're when you're that split second faster than that oh, that that guard who's is trying to double up and get to you, then you're going to be in the right spot most of the time. And he's in the right spot most of the time. And when you're in the right spot most of the time, all you need then is just to have the the attitude of wanting to make the tackle. To be honest with you, and like that's what I've noticed from him. It just seems like he's just a little bit. You know, I don't know what his forty time is, but some people are are, are short, and you know, what Coach Coffee say, everybody's a pro bowler in shorts. Some people run great forty times, but their game speed is, is slower. I would think I would I would venture to say that Blake seems to be the guy who's the opposite of that, where he's not going to blow you away on your forty times, but his game speed seems to be superb. And when you think about that from a middle linebacker standpoint, when you think about him being able to get people in the right position. You know that's that's what I look look for in a middle linebacker, and he seems to have all those traits. Well, his acumen. I mean, like a lot of players, Justin. You know, um, as long as you play the game, and I've been around, there's guys that they don't have the uh, the measurables, but they certainly have the Perfect. acumen, and they're they're at the right place at the right time, and they're able to make make uh, the tackles or interceptions or what have you. The well, the last question for me, Justin. And once again, we thank you so much for coming on the program today. Um, you hear all the time about Coach Judge. Um, he's a guy that he he has people. He surrounded himself with a buttload of uh, coaches, if you will. He's got a bunch of them. Everybody's like, why are they why are they hiring so many coaches? This and that. Well, there's a reason for it, and he talks about teaching. Um, you've been around multiple coaches in your career, coming from college and into the pros. How important is that? at this level and is it as important that people are making it because i feel like sometimes guys just don't want to listen they want to do it their own way and pretty pretty soon they're out of the league yeah i think it's actually more important for teaching in the pros and the people like what do you mean you've played all these 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 years and and been you know this dominant player in college and high school and now you get to the pros you should you should be above coaching right you should be the guy who's you know just go play and the reason why i say it is most athletes in the nfl are just freakish Mm-hmm. We're just freakish athletes, that, and you know about this. You know, you, we're all we're all freakish athletes, right? And that allows us to go out there and play and do plays that people are like. Oh God, that was great. That was this. That was that. And I, I used to always tell people in the, in the, in the, in college, no matter what what level you played in, you're probably playing against one, maybe two All Americans in the game, right? When you get to the pros, all of us was All Americans. All of us was the dominant player in our school and in our league, whatever it may be. So, what do you see that differentiating factor, right? Those those players who can start to say, "All right, I am a freakish athlete, but how do I add value to that? How do I, as a wide receiver, yes, I can run a four two forty, but how do I take, you know, my route running to the next level as a D lineman? Yes, I'm, you know, six six, long arms, all the measurables, got a quick twitch and all this, but how do I win these blocks against the Joe Thomases of the world, these other freakish athletes. And that's me studying how do I put my hands here? How do I, mm-hmm. what move I need to do against a puncher? What move I need to do against a rapper? What move I need to go, do against this guy who's more aggressive and so on and so forth? When it comes to that, that's why I think he's, you know, Joe Judge is hitting the nail on the head right here from a coaching standpoint. Coaching these players up, getting them to understand that, yes, you are a freakish athlete, but we can get so much more out of you if you understand the little things that you're doing to take away from your freakish abilities. You know, there's, a, there's you know little things about pass rushing that people don't even think about. The average fan doesn't think about the split seconds that you're wasting in your get off. You know, mm-hmm. where is your eyes being placed um, on the snap of the ball? Where is your hands being placed on this type of block? Where is your hands being placed if if you get a down block and a and a seal out by a tight end, all these different things that if you haven't been coached to do them, you can be the freakish athlete. You can be the biggest freakish athlete you want to. You're still going to be that split second away. And how many times have we seen quarterbacks get the ball out of their hands right before they're getting hit? So think yeah. about it. If you was able to, to recoup that little split second, how many more sacks would you have? How many more quarterback hits would you have? How many more interceptions would you have if you came out of your break 
you know, this much smoother than what you would have done if you didn't have that culture. And I think those are the little things that I that you you see the really good team. The teams that are good every year are the teams that are well coached. Point blank period. Coach Coffin had a system and our teams were well coached. We wouldn't you know you can talk about this league. We wasn't always the most talented team that won the game. We would we were most most of the time we would have one that came in more prepared and well coached. Mm-hmm. So that I, I, I agree one hundred percent with what his his uh, his system is doing on that regard. That's that great. is two time Super Bowl champion Justin Tuck, now coaching people as vice president of Goldman Sachs on the finances. I know you gotta get back to the financial ticker, Justin, but before Look, you do I'm, I'm, I'm sitting I'm sitting at my computer trading right now. I, 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 I'm <laughs> hey you got any tips for us? We could certainly use a few. <laughs> so what, what are you trading are you trading cards? Are you baseball, football? Mm. What are you trading there? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but before you go, I do want to give you a second. I know the pandemic is caused a lot of crazy things around uh, the world in the last year and a half. The Tuck's Rush for Literacy, which you were so, so good to do years ago when you were with the Giants. Uh, do you have anything coming up that uh, that people should know about? Uh, you know, what we've done with Tuck's Rush for Literacy is we had so much success in New York and the surrounding areas. And obviously, thank you to our fans. Thank you to everyone who supported. You know, we, you know, we just figured that the best way for us to add value to our mission was to create a donor advised fund. So that's what me and my wife did. Uh, we have tremendous sponsors, tremendous, um, you know, tremendous um, leadership and tremendous people who constantly, you know, from a financing standpoint, you know, continue to help us out and continue to, to be right there with us. And what we've done is we've, we've, we've partnered with a lot of uh, similar mission um 501c3 to be a little bit more of a, a funding help to their mission because we never really had an issue as far as raising money, but we also didn't have the need for the amount of money that we were raising. So we went out and, and partnered with a lot of similar mission people and, and helped them kind of get their, their programming off the, off, the, off the bat. So Touch Rush Literacy has changed a little bit than what it was. We're still doing some programming in some of the schools that we sponsor, but most of our role now is in a, in a, in a donor advised fund um, well. well, you see, folks, this is why Justin Tuck is in the Giants' ring of honor, just not because of what he did as a player, but because of what he does as a human being and in the community. Justin, we always love talking to you. We love seeing you, and we hope that uh, you'll be out at the stadium sometime this fall. I definitely plan to be so. And, again, always a pleasure, guys. I have a great, great rest can't of wait, day. Can't wait to see you, Justin. Thanks again. Stay well. And, Feeks, man, stop, dog, stop, stop ducking me on the golf game, man. Oh, please. I know you're, I know you're, you're like ready. one handicap. <laughs> I know you're like a one handicap, but like, well, man, I, listen, I like you're, to learn you're from big, you. Listen, you're big time now. I don't know how you get out of the office to play golf anymore. So I'm probably going to have to give you a bunch of strokes. <laughs> that would be the case if, if I was just retired sitting on the couch as well. So that's not really anything new. <laughs> hey, hey, anytime you want to go out, it, it was it's on me, okay? And we will go. I'll just, you know, we'll just have to that's play a big for time it. statement right there. You heard him say it's on him. It's on me. That's good. Oh, we we heard that, but Justin, you got to promise us when when you beat him, we need you to call in and give us the scores. Tatino, seriously? Yeah, I'm definitely not going to beat him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Justin, can you, can you just clarify one thing before you leave? And again, thank you so much for coming on. When you talked about all these freakish athletes, you're calling me one of those freakish athletes, right? Because I am. I, I mean, I was on the 100%. field, right? So. I just want I just want Paul and John to understand that because I don't Listen. feel like they really understand how freakish I am. Um, but oh, we I'm know you're freak. You okay, that's I'll, good. I'll tell you a story, and this is gonna be the last story. And I'm gonna jump off. Seagulls was so freakish that he's the only punter I ever seen. I mean, y'all remember the old bubble, right? You sure. remember the light in the old bubble? <laughs> the one that I'm collapsed lying, a couple me, of times. Stop me! Stop me if I'm lying, Seagull. He's the only punter I ever seen call his shots. He would tell you which. Light he was going to yeah. hit. And I, I mean, <laughs> and I was true. a rookie and second year guy, but I don't remember him ever missing. And then he <laughs> would even take it up a notch. From about forty eight yards out, he would pick a pylon at the goal line. Oh yeah, yeah. And he and he would hit it. <laughs> if you gave him three balls, he would hit it twice. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? So it's, I mean, I, listen, had a, I, I had a, a constant bet with Coach Bass. Field, but I, that 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 is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life. And Thank he you. obviously backed it up with how he did it in the game. How many Thank punters have, have, have played 20-plus years in the league? There's not many. Not so, many. Nope. That's, well, that's, my, that's, my, that's my praise to Fiegel. Thank you, Justin. I and appreciate it. And he was it. a defensive player's that's right. MVP. 
That's when, right. you're, when you're when you're downing balls inside the ten yard line, and I'm getting to I'm getting to you know start my drive, and they got to go ninety yards to score. That's mm-hmm. that's that's the defensive player's MVP. That's fun. Yep, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing that for you guys, and uh, can't do it anymore. Obviously, none of us can. But <laughs> we always like to look at the memories. And you're one of one of my great teammates of all time, Justin. Thank you so much for joining the show with us today and talking a little bit giant stuff. And hopefully, we can do it again. Stay well. Hey, pleasure. Y'all guys have a good one. You too.